Thank you. And as Parliament resumes, our uh, next item of business is consideration of business motion 6270 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau uh, on the suspension of standing orders in relation to consideration of an SSI later this afternoon. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 6270. Formally moved. Thank you. No one's asked to speak against the motion. The question is that motion 6270 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are. So the next item of business is portfolio questions. Question one has not been lodged. Question two, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to address the reported shortage of dentists in rural and island communities. Minister Aileen Campbell. Uh, we have seen a substantial increase under this government in the numbers of high street dentists providing NHS dental care in Scotland. We recognise the potential challenges facing very remote and island communities and that's why we've put recruitment and retention allowances for high street dentists in place. The areas where these allowances are available are, renewed annually and, uh, are reviewed annually to ensure the needs of our island and rural communities are reflected. Rudy Grant. Um, I thank the Minister for that um, answer, but it has had little impact. She will be aware that a dentist practice has closed in Lewis with proposals to close another one there. The lack of dentists in Lewis means that 6,000 people are without a dentist and a similar situation in Shetland where people are being asked to fly to the mainland to access private dental treatment. Nothing that she has specified has changed that. It's not enough, and she knows that poor dental health impacts on an individual's overall health. What is she going to do to make sure that my constituents can access dental services close to home? Minister. Um, officials are working closely with the board the, uh, and for, in relation to Lewis over the last few months, and we expect a new high street dental practice to open within the coming months in Stornoway. And as soon as an opening date has been confirmed, we'll be sure to let interested members know about it. In terms of Shetland, uh, there is a, a capacity being built because this is the first time that a high street dental practice is offering NHS dental services happening, and that will open uh, in Shetland. And that will also then enable the board to free up the uh, PDS, the public dental service, to ensure that um, those islands that are um, further away from uh, the mainland of Shetland to have access to uh, dentists. But I should point out, however, that this record of this government is, 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 is strong when it comes to dentists. Uh, 91 per cent, over 91 per cent of the people in Scotland are registered with an NHS dentist. That's compared to only 52 per cent in September in 2007. So what we inherited in 2007 has been drastically overcome and we'll continue to build on that record to ensure people across the country, regardless of whether they live in rural or island communities, get the access that they deserve. Edward Mountain. Um, just to really question the Minister further, because it's not just about dental health. In Caithness, we've got the situation where there are plans for MHS Highland to pool services between three medical surgeries, which is totally unacceptable. Does the Minister have a view on that, or is that acceptable as well? It's slightly tangential, but if the Minister can briefly respond. Well, I, I think... Um, we endeavour to ensure that we engage with the member about the issues, but you know, what we are doing as a government is ensuring that adequate provision is, is, is provided locally for people who are requiring uh, medical help and support, and ensuring as well that the clinically driven evidence that ensures that we have uh, appropriate uh, sightings of specialist services is, is delivered in, in, in a safe way for patients. So we have a strong record again on ensuring that uh, medical provision, medical support is provided in localities suited to people and will again, you know, in the, in the issue that um, Edward Mountain raises, we'll continue to, to work with him uh, to ensure that that pr provision can be enhanced. And Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. I've got a relevant supplementary question. Ah. I remember a situation in Aberdeen in Aberdeenshire years ago where there were queues around the block to register with NHS dentists. Such was the demand of patients relative to the shortage of NHS dentists. Can I ask the Minister how the number of dentists been trained and employed to deliver NHS services have changed in the last decade? And the Minister will note that it's for the Chair to decide which is relevant and what is not relevant. Minister. Thank you. Um, I think, however, though, um, 
uh, Jilly Martin is right and correct to point out that there has been significant change over the last 10 years. And part of that success has been to the, down to the opening of the Aberdeen Dental School nearby where uh, the member represents in 2008, which has helped increase the supply of dentists in the north of Scotland by 31% over the same period. Again, uh, over the last 10 years, the number of dentists, dentists providing NHS general dental service, both independent and employed, has increased by almost 30%. And we now have nearly 3,350 dentists in Scotland providing NHS general dental services and we continue to train dentists to ensure the dental workforce of the future reflects the needs of our population with 178 students expected to graduate uh, this year compared to 133 in 2008. Question number three, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government how many nurses from the rest of the EU have registered to work in Scotland since the EU referendum was held in the light of a recent report suggesting there has been a 96% decline for the UK as a whole. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. Uh, it's important to note that despite the huge drop in registrations across the UK as a whole that the member refers to, the Nursing and Midwifery Council has actually recorded an increase of approximately 7.4% over the year to May 2017 in the number of EU trained nurses registered to an address in Scotland. Colin Beattie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The Cabinet Secretary might be aware that as the nursing establishment has expanded following the application of workforce planning tools, that the boards have a number of vacancies to fill. Would the Minister therefore agree that losing the option of freely recruiting nurses from elsewhere in the EU will result in great strains in the NHS and may impact on patient services across the region and in my constituency of Midlothian North and Musselburgh in particular? Secretary. Well, I very much agree with, with the member on that. The health foundation figures, which the member refers to, uh, shows a 96% a drop in the number of nurses from the EU registering to practice in the UK as a whole since July last year. And it's extremely concerning with only 46 EU nurses registering in April this year. And the, the point is this, that without EU nurses, it will be even harder for the NHS and social care providers to find the staff they need to provide our services, which would be another negative consequence of a, a hard Brexit, which of course we need to avoid. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you. In terms of nurse shortages, can I remind the Cabinet Secretary that nurse shortages have existed for a long time before the EU referendum. In fact, when Health Secretary, the First Minister cut nurse training places by a fifth, Will the Cabinet Secretary therefore accept that the current shortages of nurses in Scotland is as a result of that decision? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, of course, uh, what Dean Lockhart um, has not acknowledged is that we have more uh, qualified nurses and midwives uh, than uh, previously. The number has increased by over 2,700 whole-time equivalent under this government. But, of course, there's more to be done, and that's why... Uh, there has uh, been a commitment uh, over, uh, in fact, the fifth successive rise in uh, student nursing and midwifery intakes uh, this year, the fifth successive rise to bring us closer to delivering our commitment uh, to create 1,000 extra nursing and midwifery training places over the course of this parliament. I would have thought that's perhaps something Dean Lockhart would have welcomed. Question for Bill Bowman. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to support NHS Scotland's recruitment of nurses and midwives. Cabinet Secretary. Workforce planning uh, is the responsibility of NHS boards who have fully delegated powers to recruit and plan their workforce to best serve the needs of the population. The Scottish Government works closely with NHS boards in their recruitment efforts and a great deal is already being done to deliver uh, sustainable solutions to workforce challenges. Since uh, 2007, the number of qualified nurses and midwives in NHS Scotland has increased by 6.7%. That's over 2,700 whole-time equivalent more qualified staff. We've also recommended a fifth successive increase in nursing and midwifery student intakes in 2017-18. And of course, a national health and social care workforce plan is being developed to strengthen workforce planning practice, including within the nursing workforce. Bill Bowman. Thank you for that reply. The Royal College of Nursing wrote to me this morning and said, nursing morale is low and teams are struggling to recruit and retain the staff they need. Latest figures show that the nursing and midwifery vacancy rate stands at 4.5%, the highest ever reported. With unfilled posts at this level, how will patients receive the care they need? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, um, can I say to, to Bill Bowman, first of all, that uh, we work very closely with the RCN. I meet them on a regular basis and, of course, listen to any concerns that they raise. In terms of uh, nursing vacancies, um, in, in some specialties in particular, because of the creation uh, of more posts, that has an impact on the number of vacancies. But it is important that vacancies uh, are filled. And, of course, the, some of the work going on with boards is to make sure as we drive down uh, agency uh, costs and uh, the reliance on agency recruitment, that actually uh, part of the solution to that is the filling of substantive posts. Uh, that work is ongoing with boards uh, to make sure that uh, vacancies are filled. There are some challenges in particular specialties, uh, such as paediatrics and district uh, nursing, uh, and again, partly really linked to the creation uh, of new posts. And of course, we have a major expansion of health visitor posts, which uh, will take some time uh, to fill, but great efforts are being made in order to do that. And ask Sauer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Under this Cabinet Secretary, we have seen a workforce crisis with over 2,500 nursing and midwifery vacancies. When will the Cabinet Secretary publish the workforce plan? Will it be before the summer recess? When will she clamp down on the £175 million of agency spend? And when will she scrap the NHS pay cap? Or should we accept that the Cabinet Secretary to help create the problem can't be the one that can fix the problem? So instead, wait for that expected reshuffle and ask the question of the next Health Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Um, such a charmer. Um, <laughs> can, I, can I say, in response to uh, the, the questions Anna Sarwar has uh, raised, firstly, on the workforce plan, yes, it will be published before the, the recess. Uh, on agency spend, this government has less agency spend than we inherited when Labour were in power. Uh, and of course, as I answered in my previous work underway to drive that down, but it is still less than what we inherited. And in terms of the pay cap, uh, I would hope we can uh, address uh, the issues of, of pay with the staff side. As I said uh, previously, it is important that we take that uh, issue forward as the First Minister has herself has said um, in terms of the, the position of rising inflation and costs, uh, we very much recognise. So the discussions with the staff side uh, are underway in order to find uh, a way forward that we can jointly agree on. Of course, uh, perhaps uh, he might also want to reflect uh, on other parts of these islands where actually, in fact, the pay of nurses under this government is higher than any other parts of this government, and particularly for the lowest paid staff in the NHS, over £1,000 more uh, in, than other parts of these islands. So we have done a lot of work and we'll continue to, to do that work in partnership with the staff side. Question 5, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether the Health Secretary has met with the new Chief Executive of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and if so, what was discussed? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I have met with the new Chief Executive of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, Jane Grant, and we discussed matters of importance to local people. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. And does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the new Chief Executive uh, of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde gives the Board the opportunity to significantly improve its communications with both elected representatives and also the wider public, not least in matters of local service changes? Secretary. Yes, well, I expect all health boards, including NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, to uh, meaningfully communicate and engage with all local stakeholders in line with national guidelines and standards, especially when local service changes are proposed. And I know that the, the new Chief Executive of NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, is taking the opportunity to review a number of arrangements at the board and is fully committed to working effectively with local representatives uh, and, indeed, local people in the best interests of patients. Maurice Corrie. Presiding officer, thank you. Uh, the people in my area of West Scotland are concerned by the suggested moving of GP out of our services from the Vale of Leven Hospital to RAH Paisley. It is viewed locally that this goes against the spirit and substance of the, vale of, of the vision for the Vale. The public are concerned by the time distance that would be placed between them and a primary care source. Can the minister confirm whether the moving of GP out of our services from the Vale is going to go ahead or not? Cabinet Secretary. Well, 
the, the issue of out-of-hours services is very challenging because uh, Greater Glasgow and Clyde have found it very difficult to recruit a GP to the out-of-hours out services. Now, given that is the, the challenge, they have to continue to provide a safe service and are having to look at the best way to do that. What I would expect, though, is uh, to make sure that uh, people uh, within the locality of the, the Vale of Leaven Hospital continue to get a, a good, safe out-of-hours service. And, of course, the wider uh, uh, amount of work that we're doing around out of hours uh, led by Sir Lewis Ritchie uh, is to set up an established urgent care hubs which will be multidisciplinary in nature to make sure that we're not uh, relying solely on GPs to provide that out of hours care. That is a sustainable solution but that's going to take some time to roll out across Scotland but very happy uh, to keep the member informed of the progress of that. Ivan McKee. You will be aware that the Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board has decided to proceed with its plans to close Lightburn Hospital and that a final decision will be passed to the Cabinet Secretary. Can I ask when the Cabinet Secretary expects to formally receive these proposals and what the process will be for their consideration? For example, will the Cabinet Secretary be interested to meet directly with users of the current facilities? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Well, I expect to receive the, the board's uh, formal uh, submission uh, shortly. Uh, as in all such cases, I'll carefully consider all of the available information and representations before coming to a, a final decision. And this will include meeting with local service users and stakeholders to hear their views. Uh, the member will be aware of the, the history uh, of uh, uh, Lightburn Hospital and uh, what I have said, uh, as the uh, First Minister uh, said uh, previously, that I would not consider approving proposals that don't address the concerns were, that were expressed previously in 2011 when this issue was, was last considered. Those issues have to be effectively uh, addressed. In terms of how long it's going to take to make a decision, uh, I will take as long as it is required in order to fully look at all of the issues and take the time uh, to meet local people, uh, as I'm sure the member would expect me to do. Pauline McNeill. As the Cabinet Secretary says, the fate of the future of Lightburn Hospital remains in her hands. I wonder, in uh, her deliberations, if she will con be considering the fact that many current users of Lightburn Hospital will not be able to travel to the potentially proposed sites such as Stob Hill or Parkhead because there is no bus service. And she will be aware, I am sure, of the very low car ownership of people in the East End. I'd like to ask the Cabinet Secretary, will you be taking that factor into account when you make your deliberations? Because if people can't access the service by public transport, then they can't access the service at all. Cabinet Secretary. I say to Polly McNeill that, of course, uh, all of those issues are the issues that I would look at in terms of accessibility uh, and uh, transport issues. Uh, those issues are, are important, and I can assure Polly McNeill that, yes, uh, I will consider that as part of my deliberations. Question six, Neil Bibby. The Scottish Government, when it last met NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and what issues were discussed? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, both ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with all health boards, including, including Greater Glasgow and Clyde, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Neil Bibby. I last met the Health Secretary at a protest in Paisley against the closure of the RH Children's Ward, a ward that the Scottish Government said was safe. The Health Secretary cannot ignore that thousands of families and NHS staff in Renfrewshire are totally opposed to this closure. The Health Secretary said she would listen. Local SNP politicians may be silent, but the message from families and staff is loud and clear. The R8 should not be downgraded, and the children's ward should be saved right now. Will the Health Secretary and the Scottish Government, therefore, prove that they are finally listening to families and staff and stop the closure of the R8 children's ward without any further delay? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, as uh, Neil Bibby will be aware, uh, after I had the pleasure of meeting him uh, on the 19th of May, I had a very important meeting with uh, local parents who are the most important people in all of 
this. And at that meeting, uh, which they felt was constructive uh, and uh, a good format in order to hear in detail some of the, the views of uh, local parents, uh, I uh, um, gave uh, an undertaking to have a further series of local meetings with local people to consider. That is the right uh, process to undertake. Uh, and uh, I thought Neil Bibby would appreciate that I should take the time in order to meet with as many local parents as possible. Uh, and I would think it would be very odd if he thought otherwise. So I will continue uh, to do that. I have another visit planned at the beginning of July uh, to uh, visit the hospital and indeed to meet uh, further uh, local parents as part of the very clear service change process that is laid out for ministers to follow. And that's what I will do. Question 7, David Stewart. Sign off, sir, to ask the Scottish Government what initiatives this is supporting to tackle obesity and type 2 diabetes. Minister Eileen Campbell. Thank you. In line with the evidence, we have invested in a range of programmes to tackle obesity by making it easier for people to be more active, to eat less and to eat better. These include football fans in training, the healthcare retail standard, eat better, feel better, and a £50 million investment in active schools between 2015 and 19. In tackling type 2 diabetes, our newly formed expert group is leading on the development and implementation of a diabetes prevention framework which will complement our wider health strategy to identify high-risk population and support early diagnosis, treatment, education and lifestyle management. David Stewart. <clears throat> Presiding officer, 5% of the population of Scotland have diabetes and since 2008 there has been a 25% increase in diagnoses. Diabetes costs the NHS around a billion pounds a year in direct costs and the nine diabetes care processes are a key tool to prevent avoidable complications such as kidney failure, heart attack, stroke, sight loss and amputation. Will the Minister introduce robust reporting and monitoring processes to assess how well each and every health board is delivering those services to people with diabetes? Minister. Um, I, I appreciate the interest that Dave Stewart takes in this uh, as well. We have the diabetes survey uh, 2016 will be aims to be published uh, within 12 months of the end of each calendar year. So there's already process in, in gathering information. And also the uh, expert group um, is also looking at a, a range of areas where we can enhance and uh, our knowledge of, of diabetes. The other thing I would mention uh, as well is that the obesity uh, strategy consultation will also be um, important in terms of the preventative work that we can try and help people avoid um, going down the route of acquiring uh, diabetes in, in the first place. Uh, and also tomorrow I'm uh, speaking at a conference with podiatrists around some of the work that they're doing to enhance their knowledge as well around uh, how to help treat and help people cope with the uh, impact of having uh, diabetes. Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to support the development of more innovative approaches to improving the treatment of conditions such as diabetes? Minister. Um, examples of current innovative approaches include the My Diabetes My Way, um, the current SBRI innovation process to develop personalised care and education for people that have type 1 diabetes and the work of the Scottish Diabetes Research Network which supports the setup and delivery of clinical and epidemiological research across Scotland. Uh, innovation is one of the priorities of the Sc Scottish Diabetes Improvement Plan and will continue to ensure that we provide the support the diabetes community need to develop and adapt uh, innovative approaches to ensure that people get the help and have the right support that they require. Thank you. Question 8, Dean Lockhart. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce waiting times for adults referred for psychological therapies. Minister Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We have put in place a £54 million pack co comprehensive package of support to improve access to mental health services for adults and children, which will provide funding for additional staff, for workforce development and for in-depth improvement support to local services. In this first year, £4.3 million has been awarded to boards across Scotland to build capacity within mental health services. Further funding has been awarded through NHS Education Scotland to provide each board an individual tailored offer of funding and workforce development. As part of a comprehensive package of support for boards, 4.6 million was announced for Healthcare Improvement Scotland to establish a mental health access improvement support team 
which is working in partnership with boards to improve access to mental health services. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Minister for that response. I'm glad to say that the hard work of staff at NHS Forth Valley has resulted in improvement in CAM services in recent months. However, the issue of waiting times remains a problem for adults referred for psychological therapies at NHS Forth Valley. According to the latest ISD figures, only 40% of adults' patients waiting for psychological treatment were seen within the Scottish Government's target timetable of 18 weeks. This left nearly 500 people waiting too long for support. Does the Minister agree that NHS Forth Valley needs more support to address these concerns? Minister. Uh, well, I'm glad that Dean uh, Lockard recognised the great improvements that we've seen in Forth Valley in terms of uh, waiting times uh, for access to CAMS services. Um, and he's, uh, it's gone up from 57.1 in 2015 to 99.7 in 2017. A great improvement, and I think that shows the value of the improvement team working with Forth Valley. And he should be aware that there has been an initial focus on CAMS, and we'll be looking to see uh, from the team and from boards to share the lessons that we've learned in CAMS uh, to improve the delivery of psychological therapies uh, to adults. Uh, but we have also seen, as a result of the higher profile of mental health, I think almost double the number of people in Forth Valley coming forward for psychological therapies. And that's also why it's really important that we make sure that we increase the number of lower intensity interventions for people wanting psychological therapies. And Monica Lennon. Thank you. The Minister will know that there tends to be a sharp drop-off in referrals to psychological therapies for adults over the age of 65. From the £54 million package that the Minister referred to in her earlier answer, can she say what specific work the Government is carrying out to reduce this inequality to ensure that adults across Scotland have the same level of service or access to psychological therapies regardless of their age? Minister. Uh, Monica Lennon is absolutely right that one should get access to uh, services uh, regardless of age and I'm very well aware of the work that Age and Mind uh, are doing in relation to this. But the whole uh, emphasis of the mental health strategy has been to ask ones get help fast and that applies uh, to older people over the age of 65 as well as anybody else. Question 9 has not been lodged. Question 10, Jamie Green. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce hospital waiting times in the West Scotland parliamentary region. Cabinet Secretary. I announced on the 30th of May that £50 million was being made available to NHS Scotland to help improvement in performance and reduce waiting times for patients. The funds are being distributed across all territorial boards, including those in the West of Scotland parliamentary region. The West of Scotland boards will receive up to £23 million in total from this additional funding. Jamie Green. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Last quarter, NHS North Ayrshire and Iron had the worst waiting times of uh, any health board in Scotland, with only 73.6% of people meeting the 18-week referral to treatment guarantee. In March this year, that was over 2,000 people waiting too long. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary why she thinks the specific health board's performance is at the bottom of the, the spectrum? What specific support she might be able to offer it to help it improve? But more importantly, when will she set out a timeline for when Scotland's health boards will meet the government's own waiting time targets? Can I say, first of all, to Jamie Green, I do recognise some of the particular challenges uh, in waiting times performance in Ayrshire and Arran. I can tell the member that the board have been allocated uh, £3.7 million uh, to improve waiting time performance. I think part of the challenge that Ayrshire and Arran have is around the recruitment and retention uh, of key uh, specialist staff. Uh, that's been a quite a long-standing issue in Ayrshire and Arran, uh, and Ayrshire and Arran are being supported to look at solutions uh, to that and how they will overcome uh, some of those challenges. In terms of the plans, all boards are drawing up their uh, clear plans for waiting time improvement and recovery performance. Those plans are due to come in to Scottish Government uh, very soon indeed. And I'd be very happy to keep uh, Jamie Green in, uh, informed about some of the detail of the plan for Ayrshire and Iron if he so wishes. Colin Smith. 
Thank you, President Officer. In the last quarter, 95.6 per cent of patients waiting for chronic pain services in Ayrshire and Arran waited over 18 weeks. To put this into perspective, in the quarter ending in March this year, of the 295 patients referred for chronic pain, only 13 were seen within the target 18-week period. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree this is completely unacceptable? And what specific action is the government taking to ensure those suffering chronic pain in Ayrshire and Arran are given the treatment they need within the government's own targets? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yeah, and there, are, there is a lot of work going on, and of course the, um, the figures for chronic pain services and the waiting times for that is something that uh, the Scottish Government does uh, gather information on, which is unusual. It's not really gathered elsewhere. However, it's very important that we use that information to make the improvements that need to be made. Uh, uh, Lee Campbell, the, the Minister for Public Health, uh, has uh, established a, a, a group that are looking, an expert group that are looking at how to make those improvements and support will be given to Ayrshire and elsewhere in order uh, to make the improvements. I agree with uh, Colin Smith that those, that performance is not uh, acceptable, it's not as we would want it to be and we know that uh, people who are suffering chronic pain uh, have uh, a very severe uh, impact on their quality of life. So it is very important that that work is taken forward. Again, I'm sure Eileen Campbell will be happy to keep the member updated of progress. Question 11, and ask Tower. Who asked the Scottish Government how many patients in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde were not treated within the legally guaranteed treatment waiting time in 2016? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, in the year 2016, over 85,100 patients in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde were seen within the legal t uh, treatment time guarantee, with around 3,000 patients waiting longer than 12 weeks. And I recognise that for some patients, they are waiting too long for treatment, which is why I've made the £50 million available to NHS Scotland, with up to £11.2 million being made available to NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. This additional funding will build up their capacity to make sure that all patients are treated in a timely fashion. And that's our work. Despite the actions of the Cabinet Secretary, the treatment waiting time guarantee failure is actually going up and not down. Um, as she has said, the independent statistics have shown that over 3,000 patients waited longer than the government's own legal guaranteed treatment target. To put that in context in terms of the sharp increase, since March 2016, Till December 2016, there was a 5,600% increase in the number of patients waiting over 12 weeks. How can the Cabinet Secretary justify this rise? Does she recognise the impact it's having on patient care and the extra stress it's putting on our staff? And does she not recognise this is just yet one more example of her complete mismanagement of our NHS? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to Anna Sarwar that the reason that I have announced the £50 million is because I recognise that the waiting time performance uh, needs to improve and the impact on patient care. Uh, that uh, £11.2 million that I gave in my first answer uh, will be deployed uh, to deliver the plan which Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, have been working on in order to deliver an improvement in the waiting time performance. Uh, that has not impacted as yet because the plan is being drawn up and the money has only just uh, been uh, recently uh, announced. So the waiting time performance, uh, an improvement that we will expect to see over the next few months uh, will be of benefit to patients in Greater Glasgow and Clyde and of course elsewhere in Scotland as that money uh, begins to have an impact. And Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has answered uh, the initial part of my question, which was uh, about what investment is being made in the NHS to improve waiting times, but wondering if the Cabinet Secretary could outline what additional support is provided to health boards to reduce waiting times. Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, officials work very closely with uh, boards to uh, improve waiting times uh, performance. Uh, that is why officials are working with the Greater Glasgow and Clyde to agree a plan for increasing activity, uh, which will support the reduction of waiting times, particularly focusing on those patients with the longest waits. In addition to that, a, a big programme of reform is underway on uh, modernising the outpatient journey in order to make sure that uh, outpatient performance improves and that has a, a range of uh, changes that are laid out in the modern, modernising outpatient uh, programme. 
Uh, that work is very, very important to, to make sure that those who are coming through uh, the system are getting to, to the right uh, health professional as quickly as possible in order to have their needs assessed. Question 12 has not been lodged. Question 13, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it promotes cervical screening awareness. Minister Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Uh, the Scottish Cervical Programme is uh, supported by a range of national and local resources, including a suite of public communication materials that are also available in a number of languages. Uh, a new advertising campaign launched in February this year, developed in partnership with Joe's Trust, to raise awareness of cervical screening amongst women aged 25 to 35. Various local initiatives, including cervical screening awareness workshops, drop-in clinics for women with di from disadvantaged backgrounds, dedicated staff working with women with learning difficulties, and NHS board-run workshops for staff to promote cervical screening. The Scottish Government is also working closely with Cancer Research UK and colleagues in NHS boards to develop a facilitators programme to support and promote cervical screening and GP practices and pilot projects to target uptake amongst those less likely to participate in screening. We're also investing up to five million of funding from the cancer strategy and screening programmes to reduce inequalities in access to screening in Scotland. David Jones. I thank the Minister for that answer. The majority of cervical cancers are caused by a persistent human papillomavirus infection, which causes changes to cervical cells. Can the, can the Minister provide an update of progress on the HPV primary screening in Scotland? Minister. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. The UK National Screening Committee recommended the introduction of HPV primary screening in January last year and following on from that recommendation, a full and detailed business case has been developed for the implementation of this recommendation in Scotland and was considered by the Scottish Screening Committee at the start of this year. The SSC recommended to ministers that the HPV primary testing should be introduced in the Scottish Cervical Screening Programme over the course of the next two years. Now, we are now uh, working with the NHS National Services D Division and NHS boards across Scotland to implement that change. Question 14, Angus Macdonald. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Forth Valley and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Scottish ministers and officials meet regularly with NHS Forth Valley to discuss matters of interest to local people. Angus Macdonald. Thank you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary and the Chamber are clearly aware that NHS Forth Valley has met waiting time targets for those needing specialist child and adolescent mental health support, which is a marked improvement in the last year following support from Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Uh, I note the Cabinet Secretary's response to question eight earlier. However, can she advise the Chamber what action the Board is taking to improve their adult mental health service performance? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as the members said, uh, within Forth Valley there has been a, a focus on uh, CAMS and I think NHS Forth Valley are to be congratulated on their progress and the hard work that it's taken to reach this point. And I'll be looking to see uh, this team and boards uh, look to share the, the lessons and best practice to improve access and delivery of psychological therapies. Uh, as, uh, as matters are taken forward, as well as the improvement support, the £54 million package of support to improve access uh, to mental health services uh, also includes funding for additional staff for workforce uh, development and for capacity planning within local services, which will support improvements in adult uh, mental health uh, services. And we remain determined that we'll hit our 90% target and we'll continue to work with boards to make sure that happens right across Scotland, including Forth Valley. Question 15, Brian Whittle. Presenting officer, to ask the Scottish Government how it ensures the highest quality of food is served in our hospitals. Minister Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Patients have a right to expect high quality and nutritious food that meets their specific needs and aids recovery. The Scottish Government have, has a strong set of nutritional standards in place for hospital food and in March 2016 we consulted on refreshed and expanded guidelines in the Scotland's national food and drink policy becoming a good food nation which advocates greater use of fresh, seasonal, local and sustainable produce. Brian Whittle. I thank the Minister for that answer. But given recent revelations in public food procurement and where our food comes from in hospitals through the Central uh, Excel contract, does the Scottish Government not recognise, as her colleague does in education, that an inquiry into the nutritional value of hospital food is appropriate? Minister, if you heard that. So I, 
I apologise, I, I didn't hear all of that question. However, I think it was about procurement. It was just to say that our, our contracts do endeavour to encourage more local sourcing through uh, an increased focus on fresh and local and seasonal produce. There has been an increase in proportion of uh, food sourced from uh, Scotland. Uh, and recently, the Scottish Government has convened a cross-industry uh, meeting to examine increasing Scottish sourcing through public sector contracts, where we agreed to look at how we can build much more capacity of local producers, streamline the contracts process to make it far more accessible for local producers and increase regional buy uh, uh, buying. I would also say, though, that um, we do take this uh, issue very uh, seriously, uh, and Scotland was the first country in the UK to develop a document specifying catering guidelines and nutritional standards for food in hospitals. So we'll certainly look to see where improvements can be made. We've already made improvements in, uh, across our hospitals, but there, uh, there is no denying that good quality food is part of the healing process and we'll endeavour to make improvements where we can. Thank you very much. And that ends portfolio questions. Thank you. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats before the next item of business.